my honor and my pleasure to kick it off. So my, my honor and pleasure to kick it off this morning. Um, this morning, I want to talk about so-called clone video game consoles, sometimes also referred to as bootlegs or knockoffs uh, that were developed in Latin America over the first quarter century of console development from 1973 to 1998. Um, I want to highlight the historical impact and importance of these consoles, as well as their significance for platform studies. And platform studies, for those who are less familiar, is a subfield of game studies that focuses on the analysis of particular hardware and software platforms. So like, there's a book about the Nintendo Entertainment System, or there's a book about Adobe Flash, and that's the kind of platform studies that typically takes place in game studies. Um, today, I want to argue that if we don't understand clone consoles and other forms of piracy and unlicensed development that have brought video games to audiences across Latin America and the global south, we don't truly understand the history of what are often assumed to be quote unquote global game platforms. Um, this talk is going to have three parts to lay it out. So first we'll have a prologue about the Telematch de Panoramic, a 1973 video game console, which is the first uh, known console to be developed in Latin America. Uh, second, I have kind of a critical theoretical section about uh, piracy and platform studies. And finally, I'll end up with some snapshots of other Latin American clone consoles uh, and highlighting their historical importance. But first, I want to start with an unboxing. Um, so I'm going to introduce to you, for those of you who are not familiar, the Telematch, the Panoramic, the first known video game console developed in Latin America. I was planning on filling my whole uh, carry-on bag with this and bringing it down to Lubbock, by the way. So I, I really was going to follow through with this unboxing one way or the other, but it's a little easier to do right here at home. So this is a, a Telematch console that I picked up the last time I was in Buenos Aires. We can see from the box, it is Industria Argentina Panoramic, no? Uh, from the get-go. Sorry if my screen is reversed there. We open the box and pull out this beautiful carrying case. Self-contained portable console, again, with our labeling indicating its Argentine origin. Uh, this carrying case is a significant innovation in and of itself. Figure out which way to open it. Open it up. I want the instructions. This is the console itself. I'll take this cover off. And this console is a clone of the Magnavox Odyssey console, the first home video game console in the world. It was developed in Argentina about a year after the Magnavox Odyssey itself was developed. You can see it's got five games built into the console here. These switches would switch between the games. And then these two hardwired controllers that each have a button and two dials on them, as well as all these kind of power switches and things. So this is a really unique and interesting console. This is the instruction card, Turbo Game from CCE. And I'm definitely going to be talking more about the Turbo Game as well as other consoles. Um, <clears throat> but I wanted to start with the Telematch because in a lot of ways, the history of Latin American console development um, to our knowledge right now begins with the Telematch. Um, I wanna go back to my PowerPoint and that won't be the last look you get at the telematch, don't worry. Um, let's see, share screen and back to the PowerPoint, okay? So talking about the telematch for one moment. Um, I want to say to start with the claims to historic firsts are destined for critique and obsolescence, and yet they invariably point to important instances on a long-term trajectory of development. The Telematch de Panoramic, or Panoramic Telematch, an Argentine clone of the Magnavox Odyssey home video game console, is of historic note for a number of reasons, even though the background of its design and distribution are exceedingly difficult to reconstruct. To start with, according to Gonzalo Frasca and Agustin Cotto, the Telematch was the first video game console ever made in Latin America. Likewise, the original game Football, hardwired to the console, was likely not only the first video game developed in Latin America, but perhaps the first soccer video game ever. The Telematch appears to have been both the first home game console to run on electric current and the world's first portable video game console. It reached the Argentine market a year before the Magnavox Odyssey itself reached other international markets, such as Europe and Japan. 
And although dozens of other clone consoles from the fourth quarter century of video game hardware development in Latin America have been identified, and these are among the 80 or so Latin American game consoles from 1973 to 1998 that I've been able to identify, like the telematch, these consoles' historical impact has yet to be fully appreciated and their significance has yet to be sufficiently acknowledged by the field of platform studies. Even if we start to see the telematch appear in museums and institutions like the Museo de Informática in Buenos Aires or the Learning Games Initiative Research Archive at the University of Arizona. So we're starting to see some recognition, but their importance is yet to be fully recognized in our field. The history behind the telematch is not entirely clear, but many of its core elements can be pieced together. During a trip abroad, executives from the Argentine television and stereo company Panoramic obtained a Magnavox Odyssey, the world's first home video game console, soon after it was released in 1972. While over 350,000 Odyssey consoles were produced between 1972 and 75, the telematch is one of only a handful of known Odyssey clones. Another example, the Overcal, appeared in Spain, while other notable cases from Latin America include the Argentine Video Juel, which featured peripherals, including a sizable shotgun controller, seen here, and screen overlays for additional games. Uh, this is another Magnavox Odyssey clone, as well as the Telebolito, marketed by the department store chain Jota Glotman and their locations throughout Colombia. So these are some of the relatively few Magnavox Odyssey clones that we see circulating in Latin America. Upon their return to Argentina, the Panoramic team disassembled the Odyssey and determined how it worked through reverse engineering. Unlike later video game consoles, the Odyssey platform runs purely on hardwired transistors and diodes rather than microprocessors. And in place of cartridges or disks, the games run on plug-in cards that essentially reconfigure the system's internal circuitry to make minor adjustments to the basic on-screen objects, which consist of a pair of paddles, a ball, and a line. The game selector interface operates a physical switch within the console that selects the correct card to use, making the machine far from all purpose, much less programmable. But nevertheless, Panoramic's team found the Odyssey's operation simple enough to replicate on their own and decided that they would add a game console to their product repertoire as soon as possible. But for the Telematch console, Panoramic decided to make a number of improvements upon the original. First, they designed a carrying case to contain the Telematch, its five games and two controllers, repurposing hardware from other devices they already regularly produced, such as portable record players and stereo sets. And here you can see four uh, of four pieces of home electronic equipment that Panoramic itself was producing around the same time, the 60s and 70s. You can see kind of the same knobs and switches that are on the telematch on this home uh, record player. And then these are two portable record players made in Argentina around the same time that have very similar kind of aesthetic um, and vibe to the portable uh, console of the telematch. No? Um, so they designed a carrying case. Uh, that was one of the first innovations. This is notable. Uh, this carrying case aspect as historical timelines of portable video game consoles frequently begin with citations of Milton Bradley's Microvision in 1979, six years after the telematch. Improving upon the original Odyssey, the telematch also featured an on-screen score display, ran on AC power rather than disposable batteries, used a single cardboard instruction panel rather than a 20-page manual, and contained at least two additional daughter boards to produce graphics for added games. The single page instruction card included with the unit emphasizes that the telematch is a breakthrough in applied electronics technology and notes, quote, telematch can work on any TV set in the country, regardless of the brand, year or model at any time of the day or night, even if there is no television broadcast because telematch generates its own image, end of quote. It also offers instructions on how to best adjust the contrast and brightness settings to obtain an optimal image in what was a hard copy precursor to the typical audiovisual setting adjustment screens in current video games. Finally, the telematch did away with seven of the games included on the original Odyssey, many of which required overlays, cards, and stickers, like those that accompanied the video Huel console, which were to be placed on the screen in order to add greater dimension and color uh, and, and kind of narrative elements, but many players found these overlays to be superfluous window dressing, attempting to disguise the ball and paddle tennis game as something more. The telematch included just five essential games, Submarino, Fronton or Squash, 
volley, tennis, and football. The number of consoles Panoramic ultimately produced is unknown, but it is estimated that they manufactured at least 15,000 units. Marketing and promotional materials from the original Telematch model J5, along with Panoramic's 1977 consoles, the Telematch J6, seen here, and the Telematch Junior, emphasize the console's convenience and modernity. A Telematch Junior advertisement from 1977, featuring then popular Argentine model and actress Gachi Ferrari, highlights the atomic console's bionic anti-boredom switch. And that is what it says here, perilla bionica anti-aburramiento. Um, it also, it, this is the lever that allows the player to adjust the speed and thus the difficulty level of the game, another unique innovation. Um, it also advertises the state-of-the-art tri-bionic sound. And as Ricardo Saucedo has observed, these materials reflect the popularity of two television series imported to Argentina from the United States around the same time, El Hombre Nuclear, or The Six Million Dollar Man, and La Mujer Bionica, or The Bionic Woman. Football, the only original game among the five included on the telematch console, is the first known video game developed in Latin America. Let's take a moment to watch this video from 2007, a vintage video itself, but produced in the latter days. Oh. Oh, I thought the video was going to work. Oh no, let's see. I'm just gonna stop sharing so I can grab the link real quick and put up this video. Sorry. So we're gonna finish up talking about the telematch in a moment and then I'll kind of talk about greater historical background surrounding um, clone consoles in Latin America and then end up with a few more examples. Uh, first, let me share the screen again. Miren qué combinación de qué toque, qué toque. Se metió un gol en contra. Gol en contra. Para. You can sense there's two teams, this player and this player are connected, almost like a foosball set. This player and this player are connected, and they're playing on the dials which are actually mounted on the console itself in this video. I'm just going to mute it while I go on discussing football. Without a, definition, uh, without a definitive publication date, it cannot be determined whether the football is the first soccer video game because Super Soccer from Allied Leisure was among the best-selling arcade games of 1973 in the United States, and Taito's Soccer was released in November of the same year. But in any case, football, seen here, was definitely not a copy of the 1974 version of Soccer included on international versions of the Magnavox Odyssey because it came out prior to that version. Uh, the game included several aspects which made it unique, including the use of four characters playing in teams of two, along with the addition of two dials to the controllers to direct the goalies. The instruction card, and now I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint uh, and end this video real quick. Um, go back to the instruction cards, very elliptical uh, description of the game here. And I apologize for the clunkiness. Here we go, sharing screen. Uh, back to PowerPoint, okay. Uh, so the um, one page instruction card included with the Telematch console offers a concise description of this pioneering game. Program number four, soccer. The point or goal is scored when the ball passes through the goal post. Without a doubt, the addition of this game to the Telematch console represents an early example of cultural localization given the predominance of soccer in Latin American culture and in Argentina specifically. As Frasca succinctly states, quote, I am not arguing that Latin American identity necessarily has to revolve around football, but I am arguing that it was an essential element in the creation of this, likely our first console and our first video game. Without a doubt, the Telematch was a pioneering technological development for Argentina, for Latin America, and for global game culture. As a subdiscipline of game studies, platform studies could benefit significantly by destigmatizing piracy and paying more attention to how clones, copies, knockoffs, and bootlegs have contributed and continue to contribute to video game history and global game culture. Yet to date, 
The telematch and myriad other so-called clone consoles have remained conspicuously absent from most scholarship on platform studies and video game history. And here, these are uh, several of the books from the platform studies series um, edited by Nick Montfort and Ian Bogost and published by the MIT Press. Um, so to date, these clone consoles have been conspicuously absent from the majority of the scholarship. Due to the overall absence of attention toward the historical importance of clone consoles, we don't know the name of any of the collaborators in the development of the first video game console ever made in Latin America. We don't know the definitive year of its release or the name of the programmer or programmers of the region's emblematic first video game, football. As much as platform studies has contributed to our understanding of video game hardware and game culture, its focus on formal market platform development tends to start and end with developers in the global north. As such, it overlooks the way players in the global south have historically accessed games made for the Atari, Nintendo Entertainment System, and other platforms. In other words, if platform studies fails to account for clone consoles, it fails to account for the actual platforms used to access video games by players in most of the world. As scholars of video game history, we have much to learn from amateur aficionados and archivists, and I'm sure every Brazilian uh, observing this talk is already familiar with the work of Garretimus or Marcus Vinicius Garret Chiadu. Um, my research on clone consoles in Latin America is indebted more than anyone to the regional video game fan and collector communities who've done more to preserve historic game hardware and software than any academic state or private institution. This partially explains the preponderance of console references from Brazil in this presentation, uh, because above and beyond other major regional markets like Mexico and Argentina, Brazil is also the country with the most active community of collectors of nationally produced game hardware and software. And I'm hoping that much of what I'm presenting here crosses over with the talks on Brazilian game development uh, later this afternoon. Alongside that fan community, a number of popular journalistic and academic sources in Brazil and elsewhere in Latin America have begun to cover this unique facet of the history of technological development. Slowly but surely, attention is building at a national and regional level, but to date, research on this topic has been limited and published almost exclusively in Spanish and Portuguese. Nevertheless, the discussion of Latin American clone consoles has profound implications that can impact broader discussions of technological history and platform studies in general. This is demonstrated by the few folks who are paying attention to the, to the global history of clone consoles, like UC Irvine PhD candidate Ian Larson, who runs the Twitter account Bootleg Consoles, which itself uh, is responsible for um, teaching me about several of the consoles mentioned in this talk. Certainly, there's room to expand and diversify our approaches to studying and historicizing game hardware and platforms by examining the history of clone consoles. Indeed, Nick Montfort and Ian Bogost themselves, the editors of the Platform Studies with MIT Press, uh, leave some room for the examination of clone consoles in the series, publishing works that, quote, focus on a single platform or a closely related family of platforms, end quote. Thus, perhaps Pong clones, Atari clones, FAMI clones, which is the term for NES clones, or poly stations, which is the term for PlayStation clones, could be included in the families of the platforms with which they're related. The series also promotes works examining, quote, how computing platforms exist in a context of culture and society, being developed based on cultural concepts and then contributing to culture in a variety of ways, end quote, making space for the analysis of how some of the dominant platforms were modified, localized, and adapted by hardware engineers across the globe. So there's room for it. But in practice, Montfort and Bogost's Racing the Beam, the flagship uh, book in the series describing the Atari VCS platform, um, makes no mention of clones, modifications, knockoffs, or copies in discussing the platform, even though that's how the platform arrived to the majority of the world. Therefore, the flagship work of the Platform Studies series lays out a very particular vision of video game history one that is focused on the formal practices and markets of the global north while ignoring the ways technologies have been incorporated into culture throughout much of the global south. While platform studies could definitely stand to focus greater attention on pirated consoles and other minor platforms, the importance of these clone consoles and piracy and the informal economy for video game history and game culture has begun to gain some recognition. Platform studies scholars such as Nathan Altice and Carl Terrian 
Um, and game historians like Tristan Donovan include an assessment of pirate practices in their studies. Likewise, game researchers, including Brendan Keogh, Stephen Mandeberg, and Thomas H. Apperly and Jesse Perica have highlighted the potential benefits of approaching platform studies with an eye to, quote, informal video game development practices and nonlinear understandings of technology, end of quote. Such an approach will help preserve and recognize contributions to global technological history that are erased when we conceive of those technologies simply as global, disproportionately underemphasizing the con contributions of informal developers in the global south, while disproportionately overemphasizing the contributions of formal developers in the global north. In minor platforms in video game history, Benjamin Nickel argues that studying less known examples of video game platforms can bring up important issues for platform studies, bringing scholars to question what we think we know about video game history and the ontological stability of our object of study. Indeed, attention to game hardware and software outside of the supposed centers of global game development can teach us a great deal about how games are developed, adapted, and played in different cultures and geographical locales. Nickel, uh, in this excellent book, critiques the assumption that video games are a global technology, quote, for its implicit focus on the North American and Japanese home console markets, and by extension, for overlooking the many microcomputer industries that spearheaded the emergence of video game development scenes in Europe, South America, and Australasia during this period, end of quote. And as the prologue to this talk on the panoramic telematch demonstrates, there's a great deal to be learned from the examination of video game platforms that have long been considered minor or marginal. Indeed, our understanding of video game history is incomplete without them. Likewise, Ramon Lobato's work, Shadow Economies of Cinema, sheds light on the nature of media distribution and its relationship to everyday life, particularly with regard to informal media. After all, as Lobato reminds us, informal media distribution is the global norm and not the exception. And this is true for video games as well as film. Uh, and now a brief appearance from Sonny, who wanted to just pass through. Thank you, Sonny. OK. Um, so informal distribution, i.e. pirate distribution, people selling video games at street stands rather than at uh, GameStop is the global norm, not the exception. Uh, for years, other game study scholars have spoken of piracy as endemic to the industry. And there is a paradox at the core of game development, because on the one hand, uh, copying or cloning has always been a subject of dispute among game developers and publishers, but on the other hand, imitation has always been considered an accepted part of the development process. And it's also important to remember that game hardware and software are complex technologies produced by teams of people and consisting of myriad components, making it inaccurate to simply designate such a work as a copy or clone. Thinking back to the panoramic telematch, once again, we could say that the console contained elements of existing game hardware but also added new original parts and games, blurring the lines between the original and copy. In fact, at the same time clone consoles were being developed across Latin America and the Global South, early game hardware developers like Magnavox, Atari, and Activision were engaged in continuous litigation over intellectual property rights within the United States. After Activision was found liable for patent infringement on a series of ball and paddle games in the 1985 case Magnavox versus Activision, Magnavox went on to enforce its patents against virtually every game publisher whose game used a ball and paddle format of any kind. Meanwhile, Atari's rivals were seeking to replicate the company's blueprint for success, and when Coleco's 1982 ColecoVision console and Mattel's 1983 Intellivision 2 console uh, were released and offered external expansion mo modules that allowed their system to play Atari VCS cartridges, Atari sued them ultimately settling for a royalty for each adapter unit and each clone console sold. Given the lengths to which game hardware and software publishers were willing to go in their courtroom battles against copyright infringement in this era, developers of clone consoles in Latin America were protected in a sense by being off the map for so-called global game publishers. And this is one reason cultural attitudes re regarding piracy differ according to region, because where there is no formal market, the informal market prevails. And for a long time, makers of video game software and hardware seem to forget about players uh, in Latin America and the Global South, leaving them quite literally to their own devices. In this context, it's important to think of so-called piracy in terms of what it does and what it enables individuals who are otherwise excluded from global flows of technology and information to do. As research by Lawrence Lang, Ramon Lobato, Mirko Tobias Schaefer, and others has shown, 
Informal infrastructure, infrastructure and shadow economies enable users to access the information and knowledge flows of contemporary global society, ultimately uh, enabling them to participate in the customization, manipulation, and reuse of media in ways that differ from the media industry's original intention. And this has major benefits for you know, the eventual establishment of formal game industries in Latin America. Uh, Manuel Ferreira uh, highlights some of these benefits, knowledge of video games and developers, experience with game features, genres, and mechanics, and participation in increasingly formalized video game competitions and organizations. Um, so all of these things are a result of the process of piracy pioneered by Latin America's um, first video game industry um, movers and shakers. They went from informality to formality using a toolkit based on reverse engineering, establishment of technological development networks, knowledge sharing, and collective generation of a cr critical mass of experience. The cloning process required more than just tinkering, and it produced more than just profits. Throughout Latin America, companies cloning game consoles and other game hardware created supply chains that laid the groundwork for the development of mature national game industries. Clone consoles from Latin America also reflect the ways local creators must adapt imported technologies to make them functional for local users, frequently leading to innovations and improvements on the originals. As Dong Won Zhou's uh, research explains, the process of copying can be understood not so much as an attempt to precisely imitate an original design, but instead as, quote, a set of improvisational practices that included the creation of alternate artifacts composed of materials available at hand, end quote. And this is plainly visible in the ways Latin American clone consoles incorporate unconventional and pre-existing components. One example is seen here, the Magiclic Teleclic, um, a 1977, excuse me, um, this is a 1977 Pong compatible console from Argentina, which featured controllers made from surplus plastic calculator shells. So Magiclic was already producing these calculators and they took this internal portion of the calculator casing and made it into the casing of their uh, video game controllers. Um, other examples of improvisations and innovations from early Latin American console developers abound. The Atari compatible 1985 Dynacom Megaboy from Brazil combined console and controller in a single unit and transmitted the audio video signal wirelessly to the television, 1985. While the Pro System 8, an NES compatible console released by NES cartridge manufacturer Chips do Brasil, in 1994, featured controllers with a built-in turbo and slow motion function. And you can see the slow motion function here on the controller. Um, without a doubt, these examples show that clones are not really clones after all, and that they make enormous historical contributions to platform studies, the history of regional technological development and global game culture. And now to conclude, I just wanna go through a few more examples of some of these other wonderful innovative clones and the contributions that they've made to uh, console development and game culture. And then we'll finish up with some time for questions. Um, so the descriptions I'm gonna give here are a mere sketch or a suggestion of some of the unplumbed depths of clone console history. And they point to possible directions for future researchers who are willing to take a closer look at the past. Not long after the release of the Atari Pong console in the US in June 1972, a Mexican version called the NESA Pong appeared on the market, produced by an engineer out of Zamora, Michoacán, named Morris Bear Perez. Bear founded Novedades Electrónicas S.A., or NESA, roughly translated as Electric Novelty, Electronic Novelties, Inc., and designed, manufactured, and, and distributed the NESA Pong not only in Mexico, but throughout Latin America. Uh, enough NESA Pong consoles were produced to merit a design update, so two versions were circulated, one with a plastic casing uh, with a black and white image, and another with a metallic casing that, that produced a color display. Each one featured a switch uh, for changing between games, an on-off lever, and a switch for alternating between one and two players, as well as two dials used to move the paddles on screen when playing the three included games, Pong, Football, and Frontenis, the latter of which is a sport of Mexican origin. The NESA Pong had several notable custom features. As a measure of security and quality control, NESA marked the screws on the back of the casing with red paint to indicate their placement so that if the user opened the console, it would leave evidence. 
Likewise, as a way of marking their presence in game hardware production, NASA stamped the circuit boards for the console with their company name and logo. The inscription on the back of the console's casing also offers concise visual setting guidance, quote, to improve color, adjust the tint, brightness, and contrast of your TV, end quote. The NASA Pong became so popular in Mexico at the time that the actual Atari Pong was referred to as the NASA Pong as well, but a lack of visibility in TV and print advertising, along with an ill-advised business uh, partner, led to the demise of NASA only a few years after it was founded. The NASA Pong was by no means the only Pong clon console uh, clone to circulate in Latin America, much less globally. Yaroslav Svelch has noted the presence of Pong consoles in Soviet Czechoslovakia around 1980, and Mandeberg notes that games similar to Atari's Pong, some licensed but most pirated, began to spring up around the world soon after the release of the original. The Filco Ford Telejogu, a licensed Pong console uh, released in Brazil in 1977, was the result of US automaker Ford's acquisition of home electronics firm Filco, who then began to produce car radios and air conditioners, as well as television sets and portable radios for the general market. The Telejogu came hardwired with three games, Paredao, Tennis, and Fuchibol, while the 1978 follow-up Telejogu 2 console, excuse me, would feature 10. Along with the many other Pong consoles in circulation at this time, uh, Latin American consoles like the Telejogu and the Nesa Pong paved the way for future game industries while introducing many players to home video games for their very first time. And there's the CCE Super Game. So on to the Atari compatible clones. CCE, o Comercio de Componentes Eletrónicos, was founded in 1964 in Sao Paulo, which meant that by 1984, 20 years later, the firm had ample experience with electronics hardware when they released the Super Gamey VG2800, a rare Latin American clone of the US-made Coleco Gemini console mentioned before, which was itself a clone of the Atari VCS. In the preceding years, CCE had established itself as a manufacturer of Atari cartridges in Brazil. And in addition to o Carteiro, or the Postman, which you see Mr. Postman here, um, which came with the console, uh, CCE produced eight additional game cartridges to accompany the VG2800. They also responded to the low interest in paddle games among Brazilian players by foregoing the Atari paddle controllers and games altogether and opting for a model similar to the Atari joystick, but with a larger yellow fire button, as you see in the image. In Brazil, the VG2800 uh, gained advantage over official Polyvox Atari clones, largely due to being more affordable. It's cheaper because it was unofficial. The super game shows how CCE was able to leverage its experience and preparedness to successfully modify and localize Atari and Coleco compatible hardware for Brazilian players. While ColecoVision clones in Latin America were rare relative to Pong and Atari VCS clones, the Super Gaming VG2800 was not alone. Another Brazilian firm, Micro Digital, uh, released a ColecoVision clone called the Onyx in 1983. However, after they found the Onyx to be at a disadvantage in local markets due to the high memory demands and prices of the ColecoVision branded cartridges, they decided to pivot and released an Atari compatible console, the Onyx Junior, seen here, a year later in 1984. Given that the Onyx Jr. was released in the context of a military dictatorship that had held power for two decades in Brazil, the military themed console and emotionally charged advertising campaign behind it are particularly ominous in retrospect. And this says uh, the highest rank of video games has arrived, Onyx Jr., a true battle of emotions. And there's just something utterly tragic about this dictatorial era uh, game advertisement to me, at the very least. In terms of history of console development, the Onyx Jr. had one particularly notable innovation enabled by Micro Digital's choice to use an MOS 652C processor in place of the 6507 processor used in Atari consoles. This enabled a pause button, one of the earliest in the history of home game consoles. The innovations and adaptations that made ColecoVision clones like the Onyx and the CCE Super Game uh, available show how local hardware producers went above and beyond the consoles they were copying in order to make products that were more advanced, more functional, and more appealing to Brazilian players. Um, and I'm going to talk about, oh, I think about four more 
uh, or five more consoles real quickly, and then we'll leave at least 10 minutes for questions and answers at, at the end. Um, this is another Atari compatible console, the DSMAC VJ9000, released in 1984, quickly built its manufacturer reputation for making the most refined consoles of its era in Brazil. Um, DSMAC was a Brazilian computer and calculator manufacturer that used its existing production facilities in Manaus, the duty-free zone, uh, to refit existing molds and manufacture 10,000 consoles. DSMAC circulated multiple versions of the physical console, including the rare variation seen here, which used a bootlegged Activision logo on its casing. Another innovation that enabled DSMAC to achieve success with the Brazilian audience was its translation of game titles. Pitfall became Pantanal. Kaboom became Che Ne Che. Freeway became Brazil 101, and so forth. An early, if modest, manifestation of game localization. A year earlier, in 1983, the Brazilian company Dynacom had released another Atari-compatible console, the DynaVision. Unlike other clone console producers, I'm sorry, like other clone console producers, DynaVision had previously manufactured and distributed cartridges for the Atari, and they drew on that experience in order to make improvements in the system's hardware and software. Dynacom's upgrades included anatomical joysticks seen on the left in the image with suction cups on the base for improved performance, joystick cable units on the front of the console rather than the rear to avoid problems with the cables fraying and getting bunched up, and a 6502 processor identical to the one used in the Apple II personal computer that could store up to 64 kilobytes of data, much more than was possible with the Atari VCS. It also featured an alphanumeric keyboard for programming and a novel mute function, which would turn off the television uh, volume when you unplugged the cartridge, which in these classic game consoles generally produced snow and the noise sound effect on the television. So they produced a mute function that disabled the sound when you unplugged cartridges. These are pioneering firms in the history of technological development in Brazil, and the modifications and updates that they made served local needs and desires and showed their capacity to build on a foundation of experience um, to produce successful electronic games for a Brazilian audience. I know that this afternoon there's a talk about Tectoy and the history of Sega in Brazil. Um, I'm just going to say a few words about it and say that Sega's dominance over Nintendo in Brazil was the exception to the global rule, a context in which the underdog became the shoe-in, largely re the result of a business arrangement between this uh, Japanese game publishing giant, Sega, and the Brazilian company, Tectoy. Tectoy was established in Sao Paulo in 1987 with leadership who had worked together previously at Sharp Electronics Brazil, uh, Daniel Descal, Dascal and Stefano Arnold. Um, the company developed and produced high-tech toys before finding its stride with the Sega deal, which made Tectoy the exclusive representative of Sega in Brazil. Uh, Tectoy's success was largely due to its localization efforts, which made Sega's software and hardware stand out against the competition in the national market. And I'll leave it to the afternoon's panel to talk about localization at Tectoy. Um, but at the same time, the company acted early to build brand allegiance among Brazilian audiences, investing in television commercials, magazine and billboard advertisements, and also hosting clubs for players and a dial-in hotline for game tips and advice over the phone. In the words of Armio, the company's president, we did not only sell them a product, we invited them to join Sega Club, where they enjoyed a sense of participating in a community, end of quote. Tectoy also created a great deal of unique Sega compatible hardware and software that was not available outside of Brazil. Notable examples include the Master System Girl, a handheld Sega Master System console released in 1994 that the company attempted to market to girls by using a bright, plink, a bright pink plastic casing, powder pink and purple packaging, and the inclusion of the game Monica no Castelo do Dragão, featuring popular cartoon character Monica as a built-in title, in a manner typical of the industry's approach to gendered game marketing at the time. Um, in part due to the success of Tectoy, today there are 5 million Master System consoles in circulation in Brazil, far more than the 3 million Sega Genesis consoles that were ever sold in the United States, for example. And as the console nears its 40th birthday in 2025, the Sega Master System still sells 150,000 units a year in Brazil, a demonstration of the power of localization in creating appeal for players. My final example is a bit of a Frankenstein. 
the casing of an Atari 7800 console, NES compatible cartridges, and a Sega Mega Drive style controller. This is the Phantom, but it could just as well be the console version of Frankenstein's monster or a technological zombie. The Phantom rose from the dead after Gradienci made a last minute pivot from its planned release of an Atari 7800 compatible console to an NES compatible model, but chose to stick with the original black plastic casing for its 1998 release. While it is compatible with the US format 72 pin NES cartridges, its controllers use DB9 connections, which are the same inputs used by the Atari 2600 or the MSX computer. And in order to port the Sega controller to play NES games, if you look closely at the buttons, you'll see the C button from the Sega became start and the start button became select. Gradienci had seen audience interest in Atari games decline and uh, in a conscious push to create a Nintendinho uh, compatible alternative to Tech Toys dominance in Brazil, they pivoted to an NES platform after their contract with Atari fell through in 1993, just after Atari itself had crashed. Um, it wasn't long before Nintendo itself took note of the success of the Phantom in Brazil. Uh, they actually came to approach Gradiente uh, to produce the Super Nintendo console in Brazil, but only under the condition that they cease selling the Phantom system and all unlicensed games. But Gradiente was reluctant to let go of their software business, so they created a shell company called Falconsoft to continue producing Nintendo games but swapped out the packaging, labels, and at times the in-game assets. This is the context from which Super Irmaus emerged, uh, literally Super Brothers, a bootleg version of Super Mario Bros that was popular among Brazilian players at the time and remains a sought after collector's piece today. To conclude, the history of video game hardware and software is full of copycats. Noah Bushnell created Pong by adapting Ralph Bayer's brown box prototype table tennis game for the Magnavox Odyssey, which itself was created following the design of the 1958 computer program Tennis for Two. And as Nickel has argued, a pirated platform, quote, should not be omitted from narratives of successful video games simply because the cultural practices it supported do not align with a specific set of copyright discourses, end of quote. This is why we must recognize the due place of creators of video game hardware and software in Latin America and elsewhere in the global South in the history of game development and global game culture. The pause button, the mute function, a fast forward and rewind feature, wireless capability, portability. Who could say which console was the first to incorporate any of these innovations? A soccer video game. Who could say which was the first if our knowledge of video game platforms and hardware is narrowly focused on the products of a handful of companies from a few countries in the global north. The dozens of consoles developed in the first quarter century of video game hardware development in Latin America offer ample evidence of their creators' contributions. Greater attention to examples like theirs will enrich our understanding of global game history and game culture and help reimagine and diversify the field of platform studies. Thank you very much. I started clapping and I realized that I'm uh, in my office and no one can actually hear me. <laughs> Let me turn my speakers back on really quick here. All right. So there have been, thank you for that. That uh, I don't know if you saw the chat, but you broke it. I, I was unable to see the chat while I was presenting. Now I see right. the plus. I will absolutely come back through it afterwards, but. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. We try to archive all that for us. Uh, um, um, and I think Kent is back here. Um, if you want to start off, I, there was one question I'll throw in to get the conversation going, because I, I think it got scrolled past in the explosion here. But one from the very top was from one of our, our guests, and they asked, did you have any suggestions on how we can do this archival historical work alongside collectors so we can prove our knowledge about the important era for Latin American gaming? And to add to that, a good 80% of the chat were collectors and scholars and collector scholars asking for your notes, swapping images, swapping photos. So that stuck a chord with people along with something that you had said about how most of this is undocumented and therefore mostly tacit knowledge. So could you guide us a little bit on how we do this archival work? 
Absolutely. Um, basically, this talk, you know, I'm, I'm preparing this as an article um, to submit to a journal soon, and I'm very much involved in that process. How do I reconstruct, you know, three to five pages of history about the telematch console when all I can find is a couple of things that Gonzalo Frasca has written about it or a couple of tweets that people have sent out about it, you know? And that's part of it is you have to hunt down every scrap that has been said or published about any of these consoles that you can find anywhere in on the internet or in old print publications. So I think a big part of it is relying on those fan communities, trusting those fan communities, engaging directly with those fan communities and collector communities, because again, they are the ones who have the deepest uh, knowledge of this subject and of these consoles. And so that's been a huge boon to me in my research is actually being able to get in touch with Gajetimus in, in Brazil, for example, uh, or Ricardo Saucedo in Argentina, who runs the Museo de Informatica. Um, Ricardo actually had spoken with members of the development team of the Telematch years ago, who were the ones that told him that they had obtained a Magnavox Odyssey on a trip to the United States and come back and reverse engineered it. I found that because Ricardo had made a post about it somewhere on the internet, and I got in touch with him and asked him about it. And he said that, unfortunately, that's all the knowledge that he has of it is that conversation and the people in the conversation have since passed away. So this is extremely, you know, fundamental work that I feel like needs to be done. And literally the generations of the first developers of game software and hardware um, in the world and in Latin America are, you know, beginning to meet their demise. And the, the sooner we can get to this, the better. So engaging with fan communities, um, being really rigorous about following up on any leads, I think those are some really important things. And I suspect with um, with an increasingly digital landscape for these conversations, it makes it a little easier. I, I was surprised at how many people could readily pull up images, links, discussions that at least probably get the ball rolling. Although I think we can all agree that nothing beats an unboxing video. So I think <laughs> Excellent. Glad I could provide that. I'll kick it back over to Kent. He's got a couple questions. I'm going to go through the chat and figure it out. Yeah, we're, we're, we're caught mic. <clears throat> yes, um, I agree with everybody in the chat about what a what a phenomenal uh, presentation. Thank you so much for that, Phil. Um, a question in the chat from uh, Brooklyn. Would you say that clone consoles such as uh, NES, NESA Pons were built in a better design than the consoles they copied, or uh, did they have their own problems due to the fact that they were reverse engineered from other consoles? Uh, I'd certainly say that there was a bit of both, you know, that that it's not that clone consoles were perfect and without glitches or problems or malfunctions, certainly like any game console being made in these early days of hardware development, you know, they're going to have some some glitches and problems as well. But hopefully, you know, the talk really highlights how they the producers of these clone consoles were not satisfied with simply copying and making a kind of facsimile of the original console, but really wanted to make them more effective, more lightweight, cheaper to manufacture, cheaper to purchase and obtain. Um, and I think that those are all really important changes that they made um, that were improvements on the original. And I also think it's important that even if they ended up with imperfect machines that could be glitchy, um, and could have their own problems with malfunctioning, they were the consoles that were available to bring home video games to consumers or to the general public through cyber cafes, for example. And I think it's also important to note that these individual home consoles were still outside the reach of most consumers in Brazil and throughout Latin America at the time when they came out. But there are other ways that um, access can be made like through the cyber cafe where consoles are rented out um, by the hour, by the minute uh, to consumers who might be you know, in a lower socioeconomic class. Um, but yeah, I think they definitely had problems, but they made enormous improvements would be my short answer. Can I piggyback on that question? Sure. Um, and this could be for, for anybody else as well, but to what extent is there, or was there like a a shared like cultural understanding of like, well, this is the, this is the good one to get. And these are like the, the five kind of bad ones or cheaply made ones or the games for this that aren't as good. Was that like a part of a, a conversation that was going on in video game culture? Yes, absolutely. And this is, again, I would refer to the research by Gajetimus. Um, again, he's kind of like the, the master of the Brazil collecting scene and 
homebrew Atari programming scene. There are people making new games for the Atari uh, VCS in Brazil today, and then he's part of that community too. So anyway, uh, Gajetimu says he's known, um, self-published two books, 1983 and 1984, when video games arrived um, in Brazil. And I would say that his research really, really helps flesh out some of those differences between these different consoles. Um, for example, that Dismac was known for creating some of the most streamlined and most functional consoles at the time. Um, there was also a console, you know, the, the Polybox was the Atari, do, uh, Atari, like Atari's Atari, um, because it was the official Atari clone. So there was definitely a sense that that official clone might have an edge in terms of quality control and things like this among uh, consumers at the time. So definitely they, they all, you know, generated their own reputations. And like I said, the Nesa Pong in, in Mexico became more popular than the Pong itself, not surprisingly, because much cheaper and more available. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Those things came to be to eclipse the originals in a lot of ways. There's a lot of conversation in the chat. I think folks were uh, reminded and surprised about the pink era of the master systems. And I think the chat, if I can sort of capture the theme, was that, you know, those discussions seem to happen locally. And I think a lot of people on the call were, were seeing correlations between similar economic forces in the United States in terms of the marketing of video games in the early 90s. You know, I'm thinking of some of the John Romero marketing around games and manhood, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I think the tone of the conversation was surprised at how much uh, uh, this may have very well been a much more global uh, uh, pattern in nature. Did you have any thoughts about that in terms of, you know, the intersection of gender and identity and gaming being the extent to which it's parallel or not parallel between the regions you're talking about and of course some of the scene in North America. Yeah, I see a lot of parallels, especially because we're talking about early video game history. And the parallels that I see are that in the very first generation of home video game consoles and home video games, they're marketed as games for everyone, games for the family, games for the family to sit down together and compete with the TV, um, where you know girls and boys and men and women and people um, of all genders and identities are kind of seen in advertisements um, because they were trying to sell to everybody at the time. And then you see a shift um, somewhere around the mid to late 80s toward very you know strictly gendered advertising and marketing. And that's the context where you see um, the master game girl arise and where there's also you have that ad campaign that militarized ad campaign for the Onyx Jr. with this super sad looking boy in the military helmet. Like I think there's so much to be said in terms of the gender dynamics of the advertising. And I would say that largely what I have observed is parallel to what I've seen in the United States. And it's important to remember that games weren't always marketed toward boys, that, that they started out being marketed much more universally. Um, but I would be very interested to hear more from other Latin American scholars and, and researchers about um, you know, their assessment of whether it's really parallel. I'm sure there's a lot of differences and a lot of nuance that could be fleshed out there. Very cool. The folks, we are um, at 10 o'clock central time. Um, <clears throat> so I think we'll go ahead and, well, first let's all um, give a hearty round of applause to Phil for his great presentation. Thank you. And um, also, uh, thanks for the, the richness of the, the chat and the, the great questions. We're um, recording this, so we'll figure out a way to, you know, document the, the chat as well as, uh, as well as the talk. And we'll also talk about ways of being able to distribute um, slides for those are who, who are, are willing to share them. So um, we're going to go ahead and um, take a break for 15 minutes. We'll be coming back at 1015 Central Time. Uh, for panel one, which is going to be moderated by uh, Megan Condis from here at uh, Texas Tech, and will feature Anthony Ramirez and Joey Lopez of Texas A&M, uh, Arthur DeSoto Vasquez from West Texas A&M, and um, Jalen Jackson from Northwestern. So um, get your coffee, take your bathroom break, whatever, and we'll be back here at 1015 Central. Thanks, y'all. We'll see you very shortly. Great Thank presentation. You. We really liked it. That was Thanks amazing. so much. And I will just, read through the whole chat. I know there wasn't amazing. a lot of time for Q&A, but I will be following up with all the other panels. And I'm willing to share everything I have. So yeah, absolutely. Sources, yeah. notes, everything I have. I'm perfectly happy to share. Very Thank exciting. You. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much.